my friend RJ has always been interested in puzzles, so much so that it sometimes drove a wedge between him and other people. He tends to get invested in more elaborate ones to the point of obsession, and if you're not as quick to put something together as he is, he can be a bit condescending. Overall I think he's got a good heart though, so I don't mind the occasional assholery. I was sitting in the school cafeteria Thursday afternoon when RJ plopped himself down next to me. He wore that shit-eating grin that said, Ted had just posted a new logic puzzle. So, what V you got for me today? I asked him. Your parents are pretty chill right? He asked back through a mouthful of pizza. I mean, yeah I guess. Depends on what you mean. You think they'd let us go out Saturday morning around 3? I wanna try something out. RJ had piqued my interest and was hamming it up now. He was trying to suppress a smile and act all mysterious but it wasn't working. You gotta tell me what it is first. I said laughing to myself a little bit. I knew he wasn't gonna talk though. He was relishing his little secret too much. He just shrugged his shoulders at me and turned his head back towards his pizza. I'll tell you more this weekend. Friday night came and I got a text from RJ around 10. Don't fall asleep dickhead, I'll be there at 3 sharp. I knew why he was doing this. RJ didn't have a car and relied on me to take him places pretty often. Where he wanted to go at 3am was beyond me though. He's not exactly the kind of guy to get drunk in the woods. By 3 o'clock I was on my second cup of coffee and still fighting to stay awake. RJ showed up at the front door wide awake. Ready to go to McDonald's. He blurted out as soon as I opened the door. I mind slamming the door in his face, which didn't change his attitude in the slightest. I think you finally owe me an explanation. I said, shaking my head. Why are we going to McDonald's? RJ explained it to me as we got into the car. He spends a lot of time on Fort Chong. I don't. Apparently he came across this thread about weird receipts at McDonald's there were a couple pictures included from people who had received these receipts. They all had a number written in red ink at the bottom of the paper. As an aside, I tried to find this thread he was talking about while I went to post this, but didn't have any luck. I don't ever use 4chan though. If anyone can find the receipt pictures and link them in the comments I'd really appreciate it. RJ told me that some people noticed all of the receipts were processed at 3.33 AM on a Saturday. This little detail is what got them thinking this wasn't a coincidence, but might be some sort of big McDonald's secret challenge. Kind of like Cicada 3301 or something. I actually thought this was pretty cool. I knew KFC did something like this with their Twitter account. They sent the guy who figured it out a picture of him getting a piggyback ride from Colonel Sanders. I thought maybe RJ and I could get one with Ronald McDonald if we figured this out. All of the receipts had another thing in common. They had all ordered exactly five menu items. The red number at the bottom of the receipt was always a digit 0 to 5. These menu items differed from receipt to receipt but they were all numbered orders. For example, number 1 was always the Big Mac. RJ explained that this led to them guessing that the numbered menu items formed some sort of code that needed to be input in the right order. And I think I know what the passcode is. RJ said in a dramatic whisper. Look at the receipt with the red 5 on the bottom. He continued. They ordered two number 1s, two number 4s and a number 8. I think those are the digits of the passcode, 11448. They just need to be rearranged. And you figured out the right order? I asked excitedly. I'm pretty sure I did. I just hope no one else has beaten me to it. Well, what is it? You'll see soon enough. RJ replied. His sly grin had returned. I pulled into the McDonald's parking lot. It was almost completely empty. I could see a couple employees and a lone customer inside. There was no one in the drive through line. Just pull up to the start of the drive through and sit there. Don't place an order yet. RJ instructed me. We have to place this order at exactly 3.33. I didn't like the idea of holding up the drive through line. But like I said, there was no one around. So I figured it wouldn't be too much of a problem. We sat in silence for the next couple minutes. I kept my eye on my mirrors to see if anyone was trying to get into line. RJ kept his eye on his phone, watching every passing minute. At 3.32 he told me to drive up to the speaker. We sat there silently for what seemed like an eternity as the poor employee tried to get us to talk to her. As soon as a minute passed, RJ leaned over to my window and placed our order. I'd like a number one. I'll take another number one please. A number four. A number eight. And another number four. We watched as each number popped up on a little screen next to the speaker. RJ seemed satisfied with the results. The employee told us to pull forward. So how'd you know that was the order? I asked RJ. He wouldn't tell me though, 
he just smiled and shrugged his shoulders again. We got our order and paid. The woman working the window didn't give us a little wink or a knowing nod or anything. In fact, she seemed incredibly bored. I handed the bag to RJ and he tore through it for the receipt. There at the bottom instead of a red number was a red address. Holy shit. I muttered under my breath. RJ waved the receipt excitedly at the employee. Is this it? Are we supposed to go here? He asked her. The woman seemed incredibly confused. She looked at the receipt and squinted her eyes. She told us she had no idea what that address was or why it was on our receipt. RJ and I exchanged incredulous glances. Were the employees nodding on this? Who was monitoring it and writing in the red ink? Maybe they were just instructed to play dumb. We pulled out of the driveway and I had RJ put the address into his phone. It was only about a 15 minute drive from where we were, and sure enough it was another McDonald's. At this point I was totally invested. RJ didn't even have to ask me, I was already driving towards the second location. Once we got on the road again it was completely silent. There were no cars or people anywhere on the street. I suppose it wasn't too weird for such an odd hour. Still, something wasn't sitting right with me. RJ seemed to feel it too. The sense of calm. There was no sound other than the purr of the engine. No rustling tree leaves, no overhead planes, no crickets. Nothing. I shrugged it off at the time as a side effect of being so tired, but now I'm not so sure. When we finally got to the second McDonald's, the parking lot was completely deserted. There were no cars, not even for employees. All the lights inside the restaurant were on, but peering through the windows it didn't seem like anyone was inside. That's weird I said as we walked up to the front door. There's no one here. I reached forward and pulled on the glass door, expecting it to be locked. Instead, it gave way immediately, letting off a cheery chime that seemed to linger in the air. Um hello? I called out as we walked into the McDonald's. As I spoke my breath appeared like a thick cloud in front of me. It was freezing inside. Each of our footsteps echoed off the tiled linoleum floor. Is anyone here? Silence. This is so fucking weird. RJ whispered. I'm gonna check the kitchen. Maybe there's someone back there. I wasn't sure if that was a good idea, but he was already leaping over the counter. We should go. I said. I don't want to get in any trouble here. This feels weird. No, wait, hang on. He snapped back. What's that? RJ was behind the counter looking out towards the seating area. I turned around, following his gaze. There, alone on a table in the middle of the room, was a single Happy Meal box. We made our way over to the Happy Meal. On closer inspection we could see a napkin sticking out from under the box. There were two words written in the same red ink. Choose one. I looked back at RJ, and he was just nodding at me furiously to open the box. So I opened the cardboard, and reached inside. There were two small figures wrapped in plastic. Happy Meal Toys. But as I looked at them more closely, a feeling of dread began to settle in the pit of my stomach. The figure in my right hand was short and stocky, while the one in my left was taller and more slender. One wore a green hoodie and jeans, the other was in basketball shorts and a t-shirt. It was us. The figures were so detailed, down to our eye color and shoe brands. They were dressed exactly as we were at that moment. Tiny replicas of terrifying accuracy. RJ reached over and took his figure from my hand. What are? Who could have how is? RJ started asking through increasingly quick breaths, examining his own likeness in the toy. Dude, we need to get out of here. I managed to whisper back to him. I didn't know what the fuck was going on, but I was thoroughly creeped out by the whole thing. This didn't feel like a fun puzzle anymore. I turned and bolted back towards the door, still clutching my figure. RJ just stood at the table, staring at his miniature. Come on man, I yelled back at him, as I threw myself into the door. The door gave way and I was met with a blast of heat. The silence seemed to crack as I crossed the threshold outside of the store. A train blared in the distance. A dog barked across the street. I could hear cars driving along the highway in the distance. A slight breeze scattered some leaves across the tarmac of the parking lot. It was as if the whole world collectively breathed out a sigh at once. I turned back to RJ. The store was completely dark. There were no lights on inside. RJ was gone. I was frozen in shock. I was standing inches from the door I had just come out of. A door that now seemed to lead to an entirely different place. I finally came to my senses, and pulled at the door again in a panic, trying to get back inside. Maybe RJ had just moved somewhere else, I thought. Surely he was right inside somewhere. However, the door wouldn't budge this time. It was locked. 
I was completely beside myself at this point, calling out to him in a frenzy, and banging on the glass door. After a few minutes of screaming, I had to stop and catch my breath. I sat down on the sidewalk in front of the door. I tried to stop myself from shaking and calm myself enough to analyze what exactly just happened and what I should do next. That's when I looked back down at the toy in my hand. It wasn't me anymore. It was a small replica of Ronald McDonald, but his eyes were pitch black. There was a little speaker on his chest, and a button on his back. I threw it on the ground in sheer disbelief. As it hit the sidewalk, the toy let out a grainy whisper. Good choice. Now start running. As I pulled up in front of the shop, I had to recheck my directions. It was a dingy little hole in the wall stuffed between a Dollar General and a computer repair shop. It looked like it had just existed here since the creation of the first VHS tape. The windows were covered in thick yellow paper, and the outside was caked in a film of old dirt. The sign on the door said open, but it was barely visible through the dirty window. There was no way this place had what I wanted. When I was a kid, I remembered watching a show on cable called Children of Man. As a kid, the premise of the show appealed to me. The show was about kids living on an island out in the Pacific, trying to survive day-to-day -day trials. The producers had gotten 40 kids from all over America, ages 10 to 12, and dropped them off with supplies and instructions on how to survive. The host, Chris Mansworth, was a survival expert, and he would create challenges every day for the kids to complete. There were four teams of 10 kids, and the winner of each challenge got something cool for their area of the village. I watched the show religiously as a kid, every Saturday night. Right after The Simpsons, the show would come on, and I would be enthralled. I always imagined that I was on the island with them, surviving day to day. The challenges were always neat too. They had the kids gut and clean their own meat, dig wells by hand, build rafts for the raft race, and make aqueducts so their village could have running water. It was a neat idea, but the show just stopped after 8 episodes. No new episodes came out, and the station never gave a reason. This was before the internet and there was no way to check for updates online. So, the show slipped off into obscurity, and my 10-year-old self just forgot about it. I remembered the show again a few years ago when mom sent me a box of my stuff from the attic. There were a couple of old VHS tapes in there, and between Batman the Animated Series and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were eight tapes with handwritten labels that read Children of Men. We had a VHS recorder when I was a kid, and I can remember recording my favorite shows to watch later. I was excited to get to see the old show again, the memories flooding back, and I started looking for a VHS player among the tapes in the box. There wasn't one, but a quick trip to Goodwill and $15, and I had a gently used VCR hooked to my TV. I watched all eight episodes back to back and fell in love with the show all over again. I remembered the kids I liked. Robert and Catherine were my favorites, but many of the kids had also been given a lot of screen time, and it was hard not to like them too. As I watched, I found myself wanting to see how the show ended all over again. As I watched the show again, I began to notice something a little darker under the surface, too, something I hadn't noticed as a kid. The village was divided into four teams, green snakes, blue birds, red foxes, and brown mice. The teams had mostly been divided up by background, which seemed very divisive to me as an adult. The green snakes did most of the hunting for the village, a lot of their kids having a rural background while the brown mice did most of the farming and gathering because they came from a farm background. The red foxes were in charge of construction and upkeep, they were the smarter kids, and they worked with the blue birds, who were in charge of food management and cooking the meals. Every team had a representative who sat on a council. Robert sat for the green snakes, Catherine for the blue birds, Marco for the red foxes, and Shireen for the brown mice. As the show went on, it became apparent that Robert didn't trust Marco, and with good reason. Marco and Shireen had formed a kind of alliance of their own though most of it was because Marco bullied her into doing what he wanted. Robert and Catherine set up their own alliance, and Robert started holding out food to sway Shireen's decisions. The village needed food, and Robert pointed out that he and Catherine were the ones providing it. Robert and Catherine wanted a fair split for everyone, but Marco tried to split them into a class system that would put his foxes in the higher tier. Robert didn't like that, and it became clear that if Chris hadn't been there, we would have seen a lot more fights. Robert was a big 12-year-old, a stocky bruiser who won battles with his fists most of the time, and Chris had separated him and Marco more than once. Marco was smaller but definitely had charisma. He had most of the mice and all of the foxes on his side, and I wasn't sure how I missed all this tension as a kid. It all came to a head in episode 6. 
Marco was caught hoarding food in the Red Fox Village. It wasn't just food that the other teams had been bringing in either. He had been taking the comfort foods from the canteen the brown mice ran for the village and storing them in his hut. Robert discovered this and took Marco prisoner, demanding he be placed on trial. The whole village was in an uproar, but Marco agreed to be confined to a central cabin until the council could rule on his trial. Chris was setting the whole trial up as an episode 8 draw for viewers. At the end of episode 8, the council found Marco guilty, and the episode had ended with a lot of shaky camera work and the Red Foxes storming the podium where Marco was seated. That was how the show had ended. The little bell chimed overhead as I stepped into the tiny place. The store looked like a throwback, sharp-looking rickety shelves that were covered in plastic VHS boxes and thick dust. The shelves held VHS tapes, beta max, and DVD cases that were arranged neatly amongst the filth and dust. A quick look showed that they were all in alphabetical order like some ancient library. The shelves fronted onto a glass display case that held murky wonders within. On the counter was a television, an ashtray stacked with old butts, and the greasy store clerk who smiled at me as I approached. You the one who called about the tape, he asked, showing a mouth of stained teeth. I had searched for months on my own. I had taken to the internet in an attempt to find something, anything, that would give me some closure. Wikipedia told me that only eight episodes were aired, but twelve had been intended. As I dug deeper, I began to see that the show was a mystery all its own, though. The list of children that had been in the show was woefully incomplete. Marco and Robert were there, so were Catherine and Shireen and Chris as the host, but none of the other children were even named. No one, except Chris Mansworth, had gone on to do anything after the show, and his only contribution was his death a few months later. His wiki said that he had committed suicide in his hotel room, and foul play was not suspected. As for the last four episodes of Children of Man, however, there was no mention. So I took to the usual online sleuths. Reddit, 4chan, TV message boards, no one seemed to have the answer. Most people had never even heard of Children of Man, and the ones who had were more interested in my copies than the last four episodes. Apparently, the episodes were never compiled or released for purchase, and the only means by which the show still existed was on VHS tapes like mine. I had several offers for them. One guy wanted to give me $500 per tape, but I declined and told them I'd post copies of the tapes here for free if they wanted. That's how I met Charleston Hammer 462. He was a user on the hometown board of Reddit. He saw my post and the posted videos and got in contact with me about the place I was currently in. Heard you were looking for a certain tape. In my line of work, when you're looking for something, you go talk to Reggie. He owns a shop in Burlington, South Carolina, called Video Time Capsule. If you need a banned episode of a 70s drama or a never-aired documentary from the 60s, you talk to Reggie. I read the message a few times before responding. Thanks, Charleston, but these episodes aren't just unaired, they're unknown. No one has ever seen them. I don't even know if they exist, and the store you're talking about is over 400 miles away. I figured I'd never hear from him again when I hit send on the message. It took him an hour to respond. What you're after is very rare. I used to watch Children of Men myself when I was younger. It ended so abruptly that it's been an internet mystery since the net was just wells and message boards. I didn't learn about the last four episodes, though, until I met Reggie at TV Con. We got to talking about old TV shows and, after a few drinks, he told me that he had the last four episodes of Children of Men. That piqued my interest. Have you seen them? That response took a little longer. I have, it's some pretty different shit. I won't ruin it for you, but if you value the way you remember Children of Men, then don't watch it. There's a reason these episodes never made it to air. Here's the number to the store. If it's late, call him anyway. Reggie keeps weird hours, and sometimes that store is open 24 hours. He's an eccentric dude, don't doubt, but he has what you're looking for. The number was at the bottom of the message. Yeah, I said, no longer sure about what I was doing, yeah. I called you about the complete series of Children of Men. He nodded, reached under the counter, and slapped a plain white case on the counter. All eight episodes, recorded at airing, he said, his eyes studying me. I frowned, I'm after the last four episodes. His piggy eyes glinted behind the grease-smeared glasses, there were only eight episodes that aired. And you told me that you had the other four episodes that never aired. He smiled, and it did ghastly things to his poor sign face, had to be sure. Come to the back, and with that, he disappeared behind a curtain, into the back of the store. I walked around, hesitating for a moment as I touched the curtain, and followed him. I'd come 400 miles, I might as well go another 5 feet into hell. 
the phone rang six times. I was just about to hang up when someone answered and spoke through a mouthful of food. I didn't understand him, but once he'd swallowed whatever had been in his mouth, he tried again. Video time capsule, where your memories are always on sale. What a tagline. Yes, I was looking for something specific. The sound of something being stuffed into the speaker's mouth and loud chewing assaulted my ears before he continued. Aren't they all? What y'all looking for? Clearly, customer service was not their strong suit. Episode 9 to 12 of Children of Men. I heard something hit the floor, and the speaker cursed loudly. Yeah, uh, you must be mistaken. There are only eight episodes of Children of Men. Look, I said a little hotly. I was told that you have things that no one else does. I want to see these episodes. I don't even want to buy them. And I was told that you have them in your possession. Is there any way that I can just... $500, the voice returned, and the tone was not one to be bargained with, in cash before I will even let you see them. I agreed, despite the outrageous price, and now I was here in this grungy shop prepared to go into the back. The back was worse than the front. DVDs and VHS tapes were stacked in teetering piles. The back room was lit by only a few dingy overheads, and I could see an old TV casting its glow from the back. The floor was riddled with trash and I swear you could hear the mice scampering around to get out of my way. What sort of videos could I find here? Would this place give me anything but heartbreak? This seemed like the setup to a thousand scary stories, and I suddenly didn't want to see these mysterious artifacts. But like anyone else who comes this close to finding the thing they want, I needed to see them. Reggie was waiting for me on the TV. He had an ancient set that looked very similar to the one my parents had owned. On top was a VHS-slash-DVD combo player and a set of rabbit ears that stuck out like a weather vane. There was a wooden chair in front of it with a little blue pad in it. Reggie held his hand out. 500, he said. How do I know it's authentic? Look, I could get in a lot of trouble for even owning this, okay? You think guys who possess child porn go to prison for a long time? This would put me under prison for life. If you want to see those episodes, then I need the money. Are we doing business here or what? I handed him the money, and he popped the cassette tape in and walked away. Not joining me? I asked. Not for another $500 bucks, kid. I heard the curtain rustle as the show began. Episode 9 gave us a recap of the trial and then the storming of the stage. When the show started, I noticed a distinct lapse in film quality. Whoever was operating the cameras was much shorter than their usual crew, and they seemed barely able to handle the heavy rig. Finally, the camera had Robert into frame and he began to fill us in on what was happening in the village. It's been about three days since Marcos's trial and his escape. Since then, Fox Village has been separated from our village. They took most of the brown mice with them, and now they try to raid us every night for food. Something is going on over there. We heard shouts this morning, and... But at that point, the shouts got louder, and Robert ran off screen as the camera tried to follow him. We came to the edge of Red Fox Village. Many of the huts that were once on the verge have been burnt out, making a kind of barricade between them and the rest of the village. Many voices were cheering as something swung from the tree. At first, I thought it was an effigy, a dummy maybe, but then I realized that it was Cherine. She swung like a grotesque wind chime in the space between the villages, and Robert shouted for Marco to stop being a coward and come out. Some of the kids were crying, but everyone on the other side cheered and shouted, traitor, or faithless, at the swinging body of Cherine. I sat, glued to the TV, unsure if any of this was even real. It was night when the next recording resumed. It seemed that whoever was running the camera wanted us to see a raid. The night vision on the cameras showed kids with torches fighting other kids who were leaving their storehouse in a hurry. The kids with torches hacked at them with machetes, blood flying as they connected, and some of them dropped as they were stabbed or hacked to pieces by the blades of the other children. The rest of the episode was mostly uneventful. Lots of shaky cam, lots of crying, and at one point, Someone dropped it and didn't pick it up for several minutes. As the episode ended, I was left looking at my own stark face looking back at me. What had I just watched? There was no way that could be the same show. Things had gone very Lord of the Flies in the village, and as the 10th episode started, I wasn't sure what to expect. Episode 10 started without a preamble. There was no recap, no theme music, and the footage looked unedited. We see a much more professional camera crew and Chris Mansworth trying to bring some order back to the island. They are coming up through the shallows, Chris and about ten adults, coming up in the dark towards the village. Chris was talking about how this had gotten out of hand and how they were going to try to rescue the children. As they came into the seemingly empty village, Chris cupped his hands and began to shout at the empty huts. 
He told them that the game was over and that it was time they went home. He told them there was a boat that would take them home. Still no response. He moved deeper into the collection of straw huts, the fires burning low around them, and that was when they struck. Kids with spears and machetes came screaming out of the darkness, and the cameraman backpedaled furiously as the adults were taken completely by surprise. Blood flew, legs were sawed off as the pint-sized savages hacked and chopped, and Chris Mansworth was buried under a pile of children as he screamed and flailed. As the cameraman tripped and went down, we saw the shadows of children standing over him as the spears came down. The episode ended abruptly. I was speechless. What the hell had happened to them? These were kids that had been doing challenges and making friends. The rivalry between Robert and Marco had always been the most serious part of the show, but now they had devolved into savages. The 11th episode was about 10 minutes long. It opened on a stationary camera shot of the same space they had held the trial. Marco was on his knees before the camera, and he looked bad. His left eye was a puffy mass of bruised tissue. His left ear was a bleeding stump. His nose looked to be cut jaggedly. He was weeping silently, and his tears were thick and bloody. Robert stood behind him. He had always worn a white football jersey in every episode I'd seen him in, but the garment was stained red and brown now. He bled from several places on his chest, and when he raised his machete, it was with obvious pain. This morning, before the sun had risen, this dog attempted to attack our village. He violated the rules of war as agreed up by him and I. We agreed to a battle between our two villages at dawn. This snake tried to attack us in the night and lost. Thus his village is forfeit. As the winner, I sentenced him to death. Please, Robert, Chris Mansworth's voice can be heard off screen, the show is over. You can all go home now, back to your parents. It doesn't have to end like this. As Marco cried his terrible tears, Robert looked at Chris off screen and turned back to Marco. The show is over. This is our home now. He brought the machete down. Marco cried out and fell face first to the ground. Robert fell on him, hitting him with the machete again and again. Blood sprayed from the struggling child, and when Robert looked back to the camera, his face was splattered in gore. He reached out, and the camera went off abruptly. The last episode was only a few minutes long. It started with the shaky cam journey through the jungle. The runner was being pursued. I could hear the footsteps behind him. As the runner got to the shore, he jumped into something and pushed out into the water. The wooden deck of a boat came into view, and as he drifted out, I could hear oars working in the water. He sat the camera on the seat, and as he rode, the faces of children could be seen in the surrounding jungle. Then everything went dark. The tape clicked, and the TV went back to static. I left it in the VCR and stumbled out of the back room. Reggie was sitting behind the counter and looked up at me with something like sympathy. He held something back towards me, and I saw it was my money. I shook my head and stepped away from him. I had bought a ticket, and I had paid the price. You gonna be okay? He asked. Yeah, so what happened to the kids? They just left them there? Reggie shrugged, the Coast Guard picked Chris Mansworth up two days later. He was drifting in the ocean and looked extremely rattled. He wouldn't tell them how he had gotten out there or where he had been. When he got back, he gave the tapes to the studio, and the next time anyone saw him, he was dead. And the kids? The studio never pursued the show. They never sold the aired episodes. They never even tried to air what Chris brought back. They just made the whole thing disappear. I suppose there's an island out there, full of kids who went to be on a TV show and never came back. Their parents were likely told they had been in an accident or something. The whole thing was hushed up, and eventually, people forgot. You'll forget one day, too, he added, as though it might help. As I lay in bed now, trying to forget the horrible things I saw, I hope I do forget but I doubt I ever will. So if you happen to find an island out in the Pacific, maybe one full of locals that just don't look right, turn your boat back out to sea. Those natives are not friendly. In all honesty, I don't know if this belongs here or in Creepy Encounters. Any comments about where this belongs is appreciated and we'll move it to there as soon as possible. I was 23 when I started working full-time at everyone's favorite supermarket. I had struggled through over three years of college before deciding to get a full-time job and had worked a trial full-time job for six months before becoming a greeter a year before it was changed to something more serious. 
I look younger than I am and people have asked if I was still in high school or if I had a boyfriend, and I was ignorant enough to be used to those questions under a work environment. I also have anxiety, so I worried about customer service more than my own comfort zone most of the time in that position. I soon started to keep work journals detailing what I saw on a daily basis or anything I found suspicious, which came in handy for me in my opinion. There was this older gentleman that needed to use an electric cart to get around an EFS that I helped from time to time since I normally watched the secondary doors. He introduced himself as L, claimed to be in his 70s, and required the electric cart because of all the smoking he did since his younger years. Al normally would strike up long conversations about his life after he was done shopping that he would stay at least another five or so minutes before leaving, including asking if I had a boyfriend and, at one time, making up scenarios of meeting a potential boyfriend. As stated before, I was used to hearing the boyfriend question so much that I stick with saying, I don't have a boyfriend and I'm not looking to find one anytime soon. Al took this as me lying to get out of the situation when I was telling the truth. I also overlooked a lot of what he said most of the time because it was normally loud when these conversations happened. He had a rasp to his voice, which was proof of the smoking information he told me, and I thought they were things that were the norm from his time. As a retail worker, I felt it would have been rude if I ignored him and it gave a reason to think that I was his friend. I didn't start seeing red flags about his behavior until late November 2018 when he told me that I looked pretty and that he wouldn't imagine me naked. It made me uncomfortable but I awkwardly thanked him for the compliment and he went about his shopping before I documented it down. Red flag number two came a month later, the day after Christmas and some time after my birthday. Earlier that day, I was talking to fellow greeter Tom, a male in his mid-fifties, about when greeter Queenie would let us go on our breaks after empty dew spilled when I came in to do his shopping, and after he was done and I was helping him transfer groceries to a push cart. He said he saw me talking to Tom in a monotone sounding voice and left without going into a conversation. It was enough to scare me. Red flag number three came not even a week into the new year. Al came back to do some shopping and tried to strike up a conversation with me after he was done, but noticed how I was trying to focus on my job more than him. This prompted him to ask if he made me uncomfortable, and I told Al I didn't want to be rude as I thought telling him would make him upset at the time. Al told me that he sees me as a friend and that whenever he comes in, he looks to see if I'm working because I'm the friendliest greeter compared to everyone else before he left. I could tell he wanted to put me at ease, but it did the opposite as I found I was right to be paranoid about him. I started to actively avoid Al if I ever saw him again and was alone at either door, acting like I was busy and having an assistant manager switch me and Queenie to different doors whenever the two of us worked alone in the morning. It worked for a month until greeter Nora came and gave Queenie her breaks when she wanted them. Come February, I'm gathering baskets when I spot Al at the register that sells tobacco and he says, hi, to me, but I ignored him and hurried away. I later asked one of my managers to use the restroom and hid in there until I couldn't hear him. Self-checkout host Dory had noticed how uncomfortable I was as Al recounted that he thought he might have insulted me because he asked if I had a boyfriend. He then told her everything he was saying to me and Dory understood why I was so uncomfortable. She later told me that Al was very vocal about me ignoring him until he left. I told two other co-workers as I was trying to catch up in my journaling as I had fallen behind in it, and they told me to escalate the situation to the head of loss prevention, Rebecca. I eventually did once I had three entries written down and marked as my evidence, and told Rebecca what I had been doing to avoid Al. I was afraid to tell anyone in management without any evidence as I was worried I'd be brushed off as an anxious worker, but Rebecca took me seriously and said I was doing the right thing by avoiding him. Since my journaling included times and dates, I was able to give Rebecca the time frame Elle was most commonly coming into shop at the time, sometime between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., closer to the end of the month, and mainly Sundays. With that in mind, I was told to keep an eye out whenever Elle ever came back in and to point him out to her or her team as his actions could lead to sexual harassment of the customers as well. In March, I was surprised to see all come in at a later time and act more professional around me, keeping things to hello and goodbye instead of trying to make conversation. Even with the change of attitude, I still kept my guard up. Near the end of the month, around 6.50 at night, Al stated how nice the weather was and asked me if I could help him out to his car with his groceries so I could take the electric cart back inside. It's EFS's policy that the electric carts stay inside to avoid any damage to them unless the customer physically can't get to the store without heavy assistance, so I politely said he had to use a push cart as the electric cart can't go outside and I'd get him one. Al was a bit insistent in taking the electric cart out and was halfway through the entryway, 
but I pushed the push cart close to the electric cart and politely insisted that the electric cart stay inside to avoid getting damaged from pebbles and dust that could get into the cart. Al relented for that reason, had his groceries put into the push cart and left. I was relieved that the situation hadn't escalated so I had to help him, but I did take note of his car should I get an idea to try and follow me home. That was also the only time he ever asked for me to help him outside. I eventually told Nora that I didn't feel comfortable around Al and she said that I wasn't the only young woman he had said these things to, as he said things like this to other female workers at other EFSs since Nora had transferred over from the west location in the city. A little over halfway into April, I switched over to cashiering and put together more information about Al's visits so I could try to avoid serving him by myself, coming in around the time food stamps were replenished and within the 7 to 10 days at the end of the month, mainly on Sundays and Fridays and during the 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. time frames. Luckily enough, I didn't see Al after the switch. Even more coincidentally at the start of May, I found an online article by the local newspaper with a picture of who looked to be Al in my Twitter timeline. I didn't want to get my assumptions up and had Nora look at the picture two days later. To my shock, Nora confirmed it was Al, reading the article revealed that Al had spilled gravy on his laptop and took it into popular electronics to get the files recovered when the IT people found what appeared to be illicit pictures of children during the recovery and called the police. Al admitted to saving the photos and was able to describe what he saved and was arrested. The article also revealed that Al wasn't his real name, that he was really in his mid-fifties, and was from a nearby city in Iowa, which explained why he mainly came in on weekends. I told everyone that knew the story and they were equally shocked, but also relieved. I did research on his state laws on the charges against Al a few days after his scheduled court appearance and found that he was guaranteed at least 2 to 10 years in prison at the least an immediate registration as a sex offender. In October, I decided to do more research as it had been months and found more articles confirming that Al copped a plea deal for 2 years and over $600 in fines for each count against him and was sentenced in September. I had switched to another position on the sales floor by the time I found out about the sentencing. It's been over two years since then and I have my old co-workers and Rebecca to thank for giving me the fact and confidence that I do have the option to tell a customer no if I feel something isn't right, but I can't help but think about how badly things could have gotten if I had helped him out to his car and if he had other intentions in mind. It should also be noted that any electric car policies are put in place not only to maintain the functionality of the cart but to also protect the employees from injury or other harm at any store electric carts are provided and I was lucky to enforce this policy when I did. This took place the winter of 2005 in rural Iowa. I was 18 years old and attending community college. I have always been an outgoing and talkative person and managed, in my youth, to make friends quite easily. Carrie and I met when we were seated beside each other in a math class we were both enrolled in. We weren't automatically friends because she was a divorced, single mom of two small boys and she was in her late twenties. I was a teenager, just out of high school still living with my grandparents. We just didn't have a lot in common on the surface and she was usually quiet and just did her work. One day I had a bad case of hiccups. I don't know how long I had been hiccuping for but I distinctly remember grumbling and being pretty pissed off because one, I fucking hate math and two, I fucking hate the hiccups. I faintly realized that I was expressing my displeasure with my situation louder than I had thought. When I felt Carrie's eyes on me I looked up from my desk and said, Hick. Ugh. What? Hick. She smiled and started asking me all kinds of questions about my hiccups. Did they hurt? Was it a sharp pain or dull? Was it pissing me off? What did it sound like? This whole time I'm answering her questions thinking that she's fucking nuts when her final question is posed she says, Can you hiccup one more time so I can hear it? I tried but my hiccups were gone. She was a damn genius. I started hanging out with Carrie more and more at school and then we started going to her house to smoke bowls and cigarettes until I would finally get tired of her screaming kids or tired of watching her surf through her matches on dating sites all over the web. That was the thing about Carrie that I fucking hated. She was a member of almost every dating site available, as long as they were free, and was constantly updating and changing these profiles. Her entire days were consumed with checking out matches or chatting with men on Yahoo Messenger. All of this seems innocent enough but it didn't end with the internet, it started there. She would decide to meet these men, sometimes having them over to her place or going to their homes. She always slept with these creeps too and while she occasionally dated the same guy twice or maybe three times she was very clearly not seeking an actual relationship. 
while I was worried about Carrie's overly sexual behavior and ho-hum attitude I didn't feel like it was my place to say anything to her. She seemed to understand that what she was doing was indeed risky because one time she asked me to come over to her house because a guy was coming to pick her up and she wasn't sure if he was who he said he was or not. I told her that I didn't know what the fuck I could do to help, I'm 5 foot nothing and about 125 pounds, but I went ahead and went over to her house to await the arrival of her newest love interest. Right on time Mr. Internet shows up and my friend leaves. Fast forward a couple of months and Carrie found a new guy in a new town. I call him Louisiana in my head because he claimed to be from the swamp somewhere outside New Orleans, Louisiana didn't have a vehicle therefore was unable to visit. I guess the fact that she couldn't go out with him and fuck him made this man so much more appealing than the rest. She would literally not shut the fuck up about wanting to meet Louisiana. Apparently he had told her that he lived in the biggest house in his small town about two hours, one way, from the town we lived in. He supposedly had a large amount of money in stocks and bonds somewhere in New Orleans in a safety deposit box. He described his home as being a beautiful three-story, old Victorian with five-plus bedrooms and three bathrooms. He also spoke in a cute Cajun accent. Louisiana is all she would talk about and she was driving me fucking crazy. One day Carrie is all excited because Louisiana had finally saved up enough money to send her for gas so she's planning a visit. I don't know why but I didn't really feel right about her trip but I was very suspicious of this guy. I told Carrie about how I felt but because I had no actual evidence of his creepiness it was nothing more than a gut feeling. My gut was not getting in the way of her weekend with Louisiana. Apparently I was not the only one who felt that this guy may be a creeper and Carrie's and Becky decided that she would be going with her niece to meet this too good to be true guy. I should mention that this savior at was really only 3 years older than Carrie so while she was older than both of us she was only 29 or 30 really and a very heavy drinker. I look back and have absolutely no idea what the fuck possessed me to go with them to meet this man. Did I have a wish to end up dead in a ditch before my 19th birthday? I really don't know. But for some reason I decided to tag along with Carrie and Aunt Becky to meet a man that I was almost positive was a fucking creeper. I of course lied to my nanny and grandpa telling them that I was staying the weekend just across town at Carrie's house. As I am typing this out my face is flushed, my hands shaking and my heart is beating so hard slash fast that I feel like I may pass out. The events of this particular evening are fuzzy and broken. I have never said a word of this to anyone, ever. Carrie, Becky and I never spoke of it and I moved to Texas just weeks after this happened. I have kept my mouth shut about the entire thing because I know that I was fucking stupid to go with them. The two hour drive seemed to go by in absolutely no time at all and I was very obviously anxious about meeting this guy. Carrie and Becky both seemed unconcerned and passed around a joint and bottle of some alcohol. I hit the joint hoping to calm down a little before getting to Louisiana's Victorian mansion. I was immediately alarmed upon arriving at the mansion in question. The lapidated old house was a more accurate description. The house had recently been painted white recently and was three stories tall, so I decided not to judge the house by its street view. Louisiana had promised it was not a problem that Becky and I both decided to tag along and had invited a friend of his own to stop by for a little while later that evening. He had told Carrie earlier that day that since he slept upstairs in the bedroom we, ladies, would have the whole second story to ourselves. When I saw the outside condition of the house I felt another gut-wrenching feeling that something just wasn't right. I told my friends that I was too lazy to carry my overnight bag inside and said that I would get it later. They shrugged it off as nothing and Becky and I exchanged a quick nervous glance before following a very excited carry. The front door opened before we even reached the porch and out stepped a short, dowdy, white guy with thinning hair. Howdy there y'all little ladies must be my ladies friends. I almost laughed out loud at this man's quite obviously fake Cajun accent as Carrie had called it. I was born and raised most of my life in Texas so I know a southern accent when I hear one and this was a really bad one. More alarm bells in the pit of my stomach as I get a good look at Carrie seeing her lover boy for the first time. He was obviously aware of her staring and why because he immediately began apologizing for the older pictures he's had to send her. He claimed that the pictures she was receiving from him were of him just from a few years ago. He waved us inside and even though he had lied about his mansion and his appearance for some damn reason we all followed. So there we were inside a strange house with a strange man and I was positive that we were in trouble. I wasn't sure what the threat was yet but I felt it, like acid eating away at my insides. Louisiana ushered us into the living room area and offered us a drink. He was very insistent that we have something, anything to drink. We all declined but decided instead to smoke a bowl and let Carrie and Louisiana talk a little. 
I was listening to every single thing he said and I kept looking at him even though I never contributed to the conversation between him and my friend. I was listening to him describe his life, born and raised southern gentleman, and wondering to myself if he had ever even visited a state below Missouri. He seemed to spew bullshit but my friend was oblivious to the lies over everything as simple as the weather in the southern states to the pronunciation of a typical southern word. I decided to ask for a tour of the house and he seemed to be irritated with me for asking but when Carrie insisted he reluctantly decided to give us a very quick tour. We saw the living room, kitchen and one bathroom on the main floor but all the other doors were locked. He led us up a short narrow flight of stairs and showed us a quick peek through a doorway to what was supposed to be his room. I immediately felt like he was lying because there was dust all over everything but brushed it off as nothing. Maybe he hadn't slept in his bed for a while. Every single other doorway minus one bathroom was nailed or painted shut. The tour was making me feel even more sick to my stomach and I really started wanting to leave but I didn't know how to tell Carrie and Becky without him hearing. He led us back downstairs and into the kitchen where he had a big pot of beans to boil. He ran to the stove and started ranting and raving about his Nan's gumbo recipe and demanded that we try it. I walked over to the pot and told him that it looked like beans to me because gumbo should have some sausage or something like that. At this point Louisiana decides he doesn't like me very much so he just started ignoring me. About an hour goes by and his friend shows up looking all sorts of creepy. He doesn't introduce himself or even make eye contact with any of us. He just walked in, sat down, and sparked up a joint. I was okay with that because boy was my anxiety through the roof. I could tell that Louisiana, Carrie, and Becky were all getting tired of my excessive questions. Sometime during that joint Louisiana left the room to get us all some freshly squeezed lemonade. I remember him warning us that it could be bitter because he used real lemons and didn't like a lot of sugar. Halfway through my drink I noticed the way he wasn't really engaging in conversation with us ladies anymore. He was watching us, not watching me like he was waiting for something. I felt like he was waiting for me to say or do something. He went from completely ignoring me to watching my every movement. I became extremely nervous with his gaze so intense on the side of my face that I kicked Becky's foot and motioned towards him with the, the fuck is up with this guy, look. She saw exactly what I was talking about after a few more minutes of him just staring at me as Carrie rambled on about something. I suddenly decided that I had to get the fuck out of that house and I jumped up out of my seat like I had been electrocuted. Oh my god sorry but I left my bag outside. I'm going to go grab it. Carrie abruptly stopped talking because of my swift movement and scared tone of voice. She looked up at Louisiana seeing his intense glaring in my direction and as if truly seeing danger for the first time she stood up and followed me towards the door. I quickly and quietly whispered to her that I had to leave. I told her that I wasn't feeling well and wanted to go home. I started out the door with Becky and Carrie following close behind. I will never forget walking away from that house and that man. I was terrified he was going to follow us. He was asking where we were going and Becky threw him some lame answers about going to the convenience store and that we would be right back. I'm honestly not sure what it was that made both Carrie and Becky blindly following me out of that house. Like I said before he hadn't left us alone together so I couldn't express my fears to them verbally. They had both seemed irritated with my excessively questioning him. I don't ever remember asking them why they believed me when I said I had to go. Maybe they both felt it too, his sinister stare as if trying to incinerate me with his eyes. We were almost 20 minutes away when whatever he had been waiting on took effect. I started hallucinating and felt oddly sedated not connected to my body. My speech became slurred and I drifted in and out of consciousness for the rest of the way home. Both girls assumed that I had simply passed out from exhaustion and had together carried me into her kid's bedroom. I woke off and throughout the night all in different stages of panic but I couldn't manage to stay awake longer than a few minutes at a time. The next day I had a horrible headache and my body felt like I had run a marathon. I woke up, wrote Carrie a goodbye note, got in my car and went home. I never spoke to Carrie or Becky again after this incident and I hope to never see them again. I think of how much worse it could have been and thank my lucky stars I'm not dead. So creepy online dude, let's not meet. I don't even know if this is okay to post here but after two years I finally feel like I can talk about it. This is a bit of a wild one but unfortunately 100% true. In 2018 I ended up in a small town that didn't have very much in it and was pretty separated from everything with a friend I hadn't seen in about 11 years. I was staying at this friend's parents house with a friend while I was there, which was fine of course. Well, until it wasn't. I woke up in the morning and friend had gone to work, leaving me with my parents for the day. 
I sat with them and talked for a while before they offered me some water. I accepted and they poured it from a jug because the city water is so bad for you, so I get well water from my sister. All was good but I found the water a bit odd, but I'm from the big city and I'm not really exposed to well water so I assumed it was the difference. I should mention that I spend my time watching people and their body language, micro expressions, etc. in conversation because I find it interesting and over time I noticed a bit of a shift. Parents started saying things like, the world is a cruel place for beautiful people like you, but we won't ever be, and talking about how they'll always be there for me, how they'll keep me safe, how they hope I spend a lot of time there, even though I live 8 hours away. I also realized that these statements were lining up when I was taking sips of water. I told myself I was being paranoid and my parents were insisting I drink the water while talking because they were being a parent, fretting over health and stuff. That's why they wanted me to drink the water from the well, you know. I did get a weird feeling from what I assumed was anxiety about a new place so when parent was gone to do something I poured it out, got a new glass, refilled it with tap water, and sat back in my spot. This water was used for everything throughout the day. Coffee? Well water. Cooking? Steaming? Food cooked for me? Well water. The conversation kept bouncing back to those statements while I ate and such but again, just nerves. Later in the evening parents started talking about other things like how the government wanted their secrets because they found a way to cure terminal illnesses, which I honestly don't have an issue with, sometimes people think things that aren't common. And then it abruptly switched to how their ex-partner stole their other two children by using chemical hypnosis to poison them against their parents. Okay, this was getting strange so I contacted my parents and asked if they'd switch my travel ticket to ASAP because my bad feeling was getting worse. I left my phone unattended while I washed my hair, and then friend came home. I felt better afterwards and sat in the kitchen with them feeling kind of ridiculous for being nervous about well water and uncommon ideas. Until parent filled friend's water bottle with tap water. That was it for me, I said I was tired and locked myself in the bedroom until the morning when I walked into the kitchen and told them I was leaving in three hours because of a family emergency. I was paranoid for days. I actually have witnesses to the fact that every time I talked about it my phone would ring with a hashtag from the area code. The first time was a coincidence. The next three worked. I also got a text from a number I've never seen that said, Hey, Apathy, do you have time to chat? I asked who it was and they immediately said they had the wrong number. Except my name isn't common and the spelling is even less so. I handed my company the phone and they told me I needed to talk to someone about what was happening because this wasn't normal and crossing into serious worry territory. I saw my psychologist a few days later and her exact words were, Did you get a blood test when you got back? You should have gotten a blood test. She told me the behavior lines up with drugging someone. I was to monitor my mental health for worsening paranoia and or psychosis and to go to a hospital if anything out of the ordinary happened because it was way too late for any info to come up in a test. I had tech people run diagnostics on my phone and there were two programs I definitely never downloaded, like actually downloaded into a file that doesn't show up normally. I don't know how to explain it properly, so we fully factory reset my device and I changed my number. This is even more unsettling because I run virus scans on my devices unnecessarily often and nothing came up before they did some digging. I haven't heard from friends since and I haven't reached out. I'm healthy and sober with my mental health under control, but this still makes me so nervous to talk about. This is actually the first time I've ever talked about it openly on the internet, and I'm definitely nervous something will happen. But I've moved twice and changed all of my accounts, gotten a new phone, and changed my codes and passwords every three weeks. When I was seven I lived in a dusty, vacant part of the west with an atmosphere straight out of a Judy Bloom novel. Despite everyone in my neighborhood living on large, isolated plots of land, mostly ranching families, kids played hockey in the streets, crime was minimal to non-existent, and everybody knew everybody else. I had a tight-knit group of friends, names changed to protect privacy, let's call them Shirley, Natalie, and Bailey. We'd been friends since before we could walk, mostly because we were the same age and all lived in the same neighborhood. We weren't idiots, but we were definitely sheltered. The same could be said of our parents, many of whom ended their education after high school or even a bit sooner, and grew up in a similar, if not the exact same, community, where anyone who'd shake your hand was probably trustworthy. That's why no one noticed anything before it was too late. Just before the summer started, a new family moved in. Families moving in wasn't terribly uncommon, but this family had a girl my and my friend's age, so it became a big deal. Her name was Ella and her whole family was a bit strange. 
it took two weeks for them to introduce themselves to anyone. Plenty of people went over to introduce themselves, but even when it was obvious people were home, no one came to the door. Finally word got around that the father was a minister at some church no one in town had heard of and the wife was working part-time at the tailor. We spent a lot of time outside and eventually spotted Ellen, my friends, and I, and invited her to join our group in whatever we were up to that afternoon. Through that we learned she had four older brothers and an infant sister. She and her whole family had very antiquated gender roles, prayed before and about virtually anything they did, and would casually mention the end of the world as a non-sequitur. Despite this, they managed to establish themselves as pillars of the community. The father, let's call him Mr. Cyrus, came to every town hall, and his wife Mrs. Cyrus took up a leadership role in the PDA. I think their wholesome Christian image helped defray what would have otherwise been the deeply troubling outbursts of rage Mr. Cyrus would exhibit, sometimes right out in public. He'd hear another adult use a phrase like, God damn it, and fly into a frenzy about how dare you forsake your Lord and Savior, taking his name in vain. His wife would make unsolicited judgmental comments about how other people raise their kids, especially daughters. Despite all that, within a few months, you'd never know they hadn't lived there all their lives. The unspoken understanding in this town was if you left your kids in someone else's care, they had free reign to do whatever they thought best for them and feed them, instruct them, or discipline them, same as if you were their own. The first time I went to Ellis, nothing out of the ordinary happened. The second time Mr. Cyrus led all of us in prayer before we ate our snack, and afterward. I mentioned to my mom how I found it irritating and she basically said, their house, their rules. So I shrugged it off. Neither of us had any way to know Mr. Cyrus was testing the waters. A few weeks later several of our families had gotten together and Mr. Cyrus brought a rifle out of nowhere and asked us girls if we wanted to shoot some cans. He said to the parents, once he'd gotten us excited, I mean, if you're comfortable with guns. Remember, this is rural America. Not one of us girls hadn't already fired a gun in our lives and if any of the parents were uncomfortable about guns, they would never admit so in public. Things progressed little by little every time I went over. Within the next few visits, my friends and I were made to participate in a mini Bible study lesson. I guess one of the other girls had told their parents about the prayer because when we were dropped off, Mr. Cyrus said, Oh, I forgot to mention, Eileen and I had a family Bible study planned for tonight. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can bring the girls back another night. This was the West in the 80s. Christianity was the default and even people who didn't really practice felt obligated to pretend they did. No one in this town would have objected to their kids participating in a Bible study loud enough for anyone to hear. It didn't even matter because the Bible study was sort of fun. None of us complained about it. And we'd all seen how into it Ella seemed and wouldn't have wanted to hurt her feelings by complaining about it. I think Mr. Cyrus took that as one of the final go-aheads needed. In late August, Mrs. Cyrus called my and my friend's parents and asked if we wanted to have a sleepover with Ella. Everyone agreed. The first red flag flew up right away. Most of us girls spent half our days off from school doing farm chores and helping around the house, so we were all in jeans. I had never seen Ella in pants, ever, but what we wore had never been any sort of problem. When we got there this time though, Ella had laid out four of her dresses on the bed and told us to change into them, to look more like girls. We all liked playing dress up so changed without complaint but then when we went downstairs Mr. Cyrus said, look how late like you all are now. Doesn't that feel better? You've made God very happy. At this point in a play date we'd usually go out back and make mud pies or play tag or something, but instead Mr. Cyrus jumped right into a Bible lesson. He was basically giving a sermon and talked about heaven and hell and the ways to get into heaven and the ways to get into hell. He scared our seven-year-old minds to death about the fires of hell. Then he did what I can only describe as a cartoony attempt at hypnosis. This was years ago so it's a little fuzzy but he dangled some piece of jewelry, a necklace or something, in front of us and swung it back and forth. While he did that he recited Bible verses about telling the truth and repentance and the end times and clean souls entering the glory of heaven. Then he sat us all down on a couch, we were all thoroughly freaked out at this point by the heaven slash hell talk but figured everything else was just a religious ritual of their home because he'd so carefully desensitized us over the past few months. He talked about sin and repentance and asked us if we wanted to go to heaven or hell. I think you can guess what we all said. He said the only way to get to heaven was to be baptized. One of my friends, Shirley, said she'd already been baptized but Mr. Cyrus cut them off, baptized into the real faith. God's faith. He asked if we wanted to know how we could become baptized and we said yes. He said by confessing our sins and making them right with God, committing to living in a Christ-like way, 
and most importantly, accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Sounded easy enough to us. For the next I don't know how long, there were no clocks in this house and it was after dark by then, we did basically an intense Bible study. It could have been anywhere between 10 minutes and 4 hours, when you're little and not accustomed to going to church, any amount of Bible study feels like an eternity. This was interspersed with different prayers for our salvation and making different promises about rejecting sin and resisting temptation. We were all getting very tired and feeling our patience wearing thin for tolerating others' religious beliefs. Then there was a whole bunch of prepper stuff. Different types of guns, talking about growing your own food, the importance of self-reliance. Basically a lecture on survival skills, but with constant emphasis that the greatest survival skill is being a good Christian. He kept us up most of the night after that praying and such. He did some ritual blessing with rubbing oil on our foreheads. He vaguely talked on and off throughout the night about whether we'd want to go with Ella to a wonderful place with lots of other kids who love Christ and said he'd ask our parents about taking us there on a weekend trip. I knew when I was agreeing with him that I had no interest but my mom had taught me the polite thing to do when you get an invitation to something you have no intention of going to is to smile and express interest then closer to the date, say something came up. So I just smiled and expressed interest. He didn't feed us anything the entire time we were there. By the time it started to get light out we were baptized in the backyard. Then we finally fell asleep and a few hours later we were picked up. I told my mom I didn't want to go back there because it was too religious for me. I told her we were up a lot of the night praying. I told my mom there was no food also, but since I'm such a picky eater she was too used to hearing, they had nothing to eat. When I really just meant something like, they served meatloaf and wouldn't even make me a grilled cheese to eat instead. We stopped playing with Ella and just kind of put it behind us until high school, mentioning once every few years, remember that weird religious play date? Since we didn't really understand any of the promises we had made to Mr. Cyrus, we didn't pay half a mind to keeping any of them. We were exhausted and surrounded in daily life by Jesus' rhetoric that everyone took seriously in the moment and then ignored once the preacher was out of earshot. In high school it was heavily rumored that Ella's father Mr. Cyrus had Florence Haltef, famed for her involvement with the controversial Branch Davidians, visiting his home and leading some sort of prayer circle for him and people from his church. While I still don't know if she really came to visit him, it was all but irrefutably confirmed in high school that Mr. Cyrus belonged to an offshoot of Shepherd's Rod, a Christian apocalyptic extremist group rooted in Seventh-day Adventism. Nobody really talked to them much after that, in town even, because we all considered it a cult. I went out of state after high school and have no idea what happened with Ella's family. But Mr. Cyrus, let's not meet. While this was now almost 16 years ago, I still remember every single detail about this encounter quite vividly. It was so random and so distinctly bizarre that I will never forget just what happened. I'm sorry it's so long. Background, I'm 20 years old at the time and after visiting friends in college for the weekend, found myself traveling home, alone and taking a late train from Boston out to the suburbs where my car is parked. I'm running late and very concerned that I'm going to miss the last subway out of Boston, but thankfully the train I needed pulled up quickly. I remember being annoyed at myself for creating stress with such an unnecessarily close call as I was definitely on either the very last, or next to last, train out of Boston. And while I have friends I could stay with if I miss the last train, I have to work in the morning, and my phone is completely dead. The ride is long and slow and there is hardly a soul on the train after we leave the immediate Boston area, which isn't odd seeing how it's Sunday and after midnight. Halfway through the 45-minute ride I doze off, and jerk awake at hearing the blaring Braintree announcement, which is my stop. In my foggy state I grab my bag and jump off the train, and the moment I realize I'm at the wrong stop, the doors close. Turns out, they were just announcing the train destination, not the train stop. As you can imagine I'm feeling pretty lousy about this watching the train plod off in the direction I needed to be going. I'm the only person to get off the train, and the station is unfamiliar and utterly deserted. Quickly I realize I'm in Quincy, three long stops away from my destination and I'm feeling screwed. I really really need there to be another train. I look around and realize I'm close to the end of a desolated and strikingly dark outdoor train platform. While the chances for there being another train so late is extremely slim my only hope and I begin to feel panicked, stupid, and vulnerable. After a minute or two of standing there dumbfounded and triple checking that my phone was dead, I suddenly spotted a man, standing alone under a light, a distance down the long and thin platform. A little ways further beyond him, appears to be the only entrance slash exit, 
unless there are some stairs going down into the terminal halfway down that I can't see. While the man makes me a little nervous, he's clearly facing the tracks, which gives me hope that one last train is on the way, thinking that maybe he just missed the one I got off. I decide to just quietly sit on the bench close by and choose to stay unnoticed and in the dark while I wait. The bench is partially enclosed, and when I sit down on it I'm basically obscured from the shoulders down by deep shadows and can still see in every direction but directly behind me. A quick glance around it though confirms I'm definitely alone down here. So on the dark bench I sit and wait and feel comfortably obscured. With my wearing dark clothes, and it being so dark on my end of the station. I had the opportunity to rather blatantly watch the man at the end of the platform. The well-lit man is tall, thin, not old, like thirties, light slightly shaggy hair, and dressed casually preppy. He's strange though, standing abnormally still, looking straight ahead in a weird way. Something is off, but he's minding his business and probably doesn't even know I'm here. And while I feel really uneasy, I do find some slight comfort in being certain that no one is down here with me and can openly watch the only other person from my dark, in bench. After watching for a few minutes the man begins to rock a little, placing weight on one foot and then another. He then takes a few slow steps towards the edge of the platform and I notice that he's using a white and red walking cane for the visually impaired, and tapping and feeling his way as he walks forward. Suddenly I'm very relieved, as this may explain his unusual posture. Just as I'm feeling more relaxed the feeling vanishes. He's still walking towards the platform edge, and quickly. I stiffen and sit up straight, looking intently. He makes it to the bright yellow, raised metal warning tread that is at the very edge of the platform, only a foot wide, and directly before an eight-foot drop onto electrified train tracks. He stops there, banging his cane against the edge, toes literally at the furthest point. I stand up and walk a few paces closer as he starts to sway again, but more dramatically. My mind begins to race. What's going on? Is this a suicide situation? He is in a lot of danger. I want to take action and try quickly to figure out the best way because this poor man needs help of some kind. I'm just trying to figure out how to approach him because I really don't want to startle him with his being so very close to the edge, in fact, he's the furthest you can go and his swaying has evolved to a kind of dance. Suddenly, after what seems like ages but is probably just a minute or two, he stops and begins to take slow steps backwards until finally he returns to standing still and staring straight ahead, back under that spotlight. With my heart racing and mind spinning, I return to my dark bench, sit back down quietly, and try to process what's suddenly happening. I want to help this man but I am overwhelmed by alarms in my brain. I keep watching and being as silent as possible. He stands calmly for a few minutes under the light, facing the tracks, and safely several paces away from the edge. I decided to get help, I mean, he just did something crazy, really unnerving, and really dangerous and I don't know what his intentions are. I'm still sitting on my dark bench fighting off conflicting feelings and secretly watching him, when he suddenly turns his whole body to directly face me. Straight on facing me, exactly the angle to where I'm sitting, and he's smiling. He's far away, but so well lit, I can tell, he is absolutely smiling and looking suddenly right at me. I'm completely startled, and my jaw drops. My mind is now racing like crazy asterisk, he knows I'm here. He must know I'm here, but if he knows I'm here, why is he facing me? He knows exactly where I'm sitting. What? Is he actually blind? But I'm sitting in the dark and not making a sound. He's smiling asterisk. I freeze solid dash. What happens next is so sudden that I remain basically frozen like a statue, sitting on the dark bench the entire time, not making even the slightest sound. Suddenly, still smiling, he turns and faces the train tracks, and again using his cane, walks right over to the very edge and begins his side to side swaying except now it's even more dance-like. He then changes position, putting one foot right on the edge, and one foot behind him and starts this exaggerated lunging motion, as one would jump in front of a train, nearly jumping off the platform, but catching himself before he does. He does this repeatedly. All the while, I'm just watching from a distance, basically in, well, horror and confusion. Suddenly he stops all this and turns. This time he doesn't face me, but faces in my general direction my end of the track smiling still from what I can see. He slowly begins to walk down the platform towards me. He is walking right on the edge, directly on the warning track the whole time I can hear the clack of the cane going side to side. He is so close to the edge that the cane is going into the darkness. He gets closer and closer and I can do absolutely nothing but stare. How could he be walking so close to the edge? Why is he coming down here? Closer and closer he gets and I can now see him better. 
still the big gaping grin on his face, empty and farcical like a game show host, and his eyes, they're slammed shut. They aren't gently closed, they are aggressively and exaggeratedly closed very very tight. I know though, that it's possible to peer a little bit while making this face. My mind is exploding and I remain frozen solid. He is now so close, about 20 feet away. I'm thinking that if I hang on just one more minute maybe he'll walk right by me, and with him out of the way of the entrance, I can run and go get help. And maybe, just maybe, his smiling face was just a coincidence. Maybe this whole time he has no idea I'm even here. Maybe he really is blind, but greatly to my dismay, only about 15 feet before he reaches me, he stops and he turns and faces me, eyes still slammed, shut, gaping smile. He is just now standing there on the edge of the platform facing me. His eyes are tightly shut and he is facing right at me. This can't be possible and I feel like I'm in a surreal nightmare and then suddenly, it gets much worse. He starts making this weird, high-pitched whimpering, moaning, feminine, soft laugh. He reaches for the zipper on his pants and unzips them while holding his cane. He pulls down his pants and underwear exposing his penis, and then, while still facing me, starts jumping up and down all the while continuing to do that soft coy laugh. He then changes position and starts doing that jumping from foot to foot lunging motion like he's about to jump into the path of a train, except now his movement is compromised by his pulled down pants. He continues this, smiling, eyes shut, penis flopping around this way and that, and making that simpering laugh. All the while I'm sitting there is some kind of mesmerized horror state. Suddenly I hear the train rattling loudly and approaching fast. In frozen horror, I'm both groveling in thanks to God, and terrified that at the end of all of this true insanity, I'm about to see someone commit suicide right in front of me, or accidentally get hit by the train. Right as the train reached the platform and started slowing down, he returned to simply swaying again and took a step back. Being the very last train of the night, every car seems to have some people on it. I knew immediately I was probably safe. The train stops and I sprint like hell down the platform a few cars distance down and jump on. I don't know if he gets on the train too or just stands there, but I definitely don't hear anyone yelling or anything so I assume that he pulled up his pants either way. And so, once on the train, I sink into the seat, my mind thoroughly blown. My mind explodes in every single variation of the feeling that can basically be eloquently summed up as one giant with the F-U-C-K. Gratefully, at the end of all of that, I really do feel immediately safe and I'm not further subjected to worrying about him following me off the train, if he even got on because there's always other people getting off at Braintree. It was all just, quite simply, so odd and bizarre that I felt like, after all these years, sharing it. It's easily the closest thing to a nightmare I've ever experienced. It was so weird, scary, surreal, and happened so quickly that it was almost like I coasted cleanly by being scared and just settled into a kind of hypnosis and unable to move. I'm not trying to be dramatic about it, I just don't know how else to describe it. Honestly, when I got on that train, I was just sitting there a bit tweaked, wide-eyed, and really honestly laughing in my head at the sheer shock of it all. The immense feeling of relief I felt when I boarded the train quickly changed any feelings of horror to that of shock, disbelief, and gratitude.